Would you bow your heads with me? God of grace and God of glory, once again we thank you for the total sufficiency of your Son and our Savior. Thank you for the sacred space called sanctuary where we gather as brothers and sisters of the faith to worship you and to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. So speak to us now. Use my mouth to speak your words. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou dost do. In the matchless, marvelous, majestic name of the Master, we pray. Amen. We give all honor to the Spirit of Christ. Would you help me appreciate my brother, my friend, your pastor, the wonderful leader of this, the Alfred Street Church, Dr. Howard John Wesley. We celebrate him this morning. We thank God for him. And to the entire pastoral staff and to all of the leaders, to all of you who are disciples of Alfred Street, to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ and in creation, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord our God is good, and he is worthy to be praised. I want to thank my friend, Dr. Howard John Wesley, one more time for inviting me to come and share here at the Alfred Street Church. I've been preaching at this church since the early 90s when I first came here under the leadership of Dr. John O. Peterson, and to see how this pastor continues to grow this church and continues to have such input and impact on this community is such a joy to my heart and I am thankful for how the Lord is blessing this church and using this church this worship has been incredible beginning on last night with these men who have just been singing their hearts out we bless God for them on today and so we thank God for all they tell me y'all got them everywhere downstairs overflow all kind of places and so we thank God for all who have shared with us in these four services if you have a copy of the word of the Lord would you stand with me and take it and go to the gospel of Mark and the eighth chapter Gospel of Mark in the 8th chapter. Miss Soundman, can I get just a little bit more? Right here, just a little. This is the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I need all the help. Man, yeah, you, yeah, you blessing my sanctified soul. Right, right there. All right. Thank you so much. Mark chapter 8, I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus said, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, his sight restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't go into the village. Amen. You may be seated in the very presence of our God. I want to preach this morning or this afternoon as the Spirit shall guide with this thought in our minds, the right touch. The right touch. When I was in seminary in the year 1987, my first year at what was then called the Virginia Union School of Religion, now the Samuel D. Witt Proctor School of Religion at Virginia Union University. My New Testament professor was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Boykin Saunders. Y'all keep taking up my time with all of that. <laughs> Dr. Saunders, is still the professor there at the seminary. And I shall never forget my first 
year, my first semester, probably my first month, Dr. Sanders took great joy in demolishing your Sunday school theology. He took great joy and delight in watching the perplexity on your face as he began to take apart your Bible and pick apart your Jesus. One of the things that he taught us early on about the Synoptic Gospels was that the Synoptic Gospels might have the same stories, but they're not necessarily in the same order. Because these Gospels, as you well know, were written after the resurrection of our Christ. They were written to particular people in particular contexts by particular people dealing with particular issues. And oftentimes, Dr. Sanders would say to us, what the writer would do in redacted form would be to take certain miracle stories and insert them after certain teaching stories to bring a highlight to something Jesus had just taught. He would oftentimes, or they would oftentimes, put a miracle story either right behind or right in front of something Jesus is going to teach or something that is about to occur. And that miracle story would be something greater than just another example of the supernatural power of Jesus. But to the first century church, it would model a message that they needed to hear. Such is the case of the story that I read for you today. This story is not something as simple as us showing once again that Jesus has the power to open blind eyes. It's not as simple or superfluous or surface as just giving us another example of the majestic power of the Master and the Messiah. But when you put this story in the first century mind and see where it is placed, it is placed after a story and before another story that would give a message to the first century and to us sitting in here today. The story before this one is the feeding of the multitude. Stick with me. If you know the story, when the feeding is over, the Bible declares they got 12 baskets full of leftovers. They get on a boat, but the problem is they get on the boat and in haste, they leave 11 and only have one basket. So you have 12 hungry brothers who are very hungry looking at one basket to feed all of them. When you read the story, you discover that they began to have a dialogue back and forth about how in the world they're going to make it and how they're going to fill their stomachs, how they're going to satisfy their appetite when it's 12 of them and only one basket. Jesus says to them, watch this, how is it that you've been with me all of this time and you still act like you don't know who I am? How is it that you were just with me on the, watch this, on the seashore and you watched me feed more than there are of you, starting with less than you have in the basket? If you really knew who I was, you would not be panicking. You would simply say, Jesus, the same thing you did on the shore, we need you to do it again on the boat. And the story ends with Jesus raising this question. Do you still not understand? In the Greek, that word is skopa. Do you still not see it? And the next verse starts a story about a man who can't see. <laughs> Come to me after that story. When the man gets his sight, the story after the sight miracle is Jesus saying to the disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Don't miss it. Y'all know the story. They said some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Jesus said, cool in the gang, but who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, remember thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus as flesh and blood did not reveal that to you but such is my father in heaven don't miss this the story before the miracle Jesus says why can't y'all see the story after the miracle is what happens when you can see the story before the miracle Jesus said y'all don't know who I am the story after the miracle Peter says I know exactly who you are and nestled between the two is the story of a man who's blind so that to the first century church it was a message of the danger of being in his presence but not seeing his person 
it was a message to the first century church that it's a terrible thing to be around him but can't see him. It's a terrible thing to be around him but don't know who he is. It's a terrible thing to be around him but act like you don't understand his identity. And this story is inserted to show us how you get not just your sight but your vision to know exactly who Jesus the Christ really is. And I thought I would preach this this morning, beloved, because there are many people in the church who are in his presence but don't know his person. There are many people in the church who are around him, but their activity proves they don't know him. Because if I could just give you a description from the text, when you are blind, you have to go where other people lead you. When you are blind, you are defined and confined by other people's vision. When you are blind, you are led where people want you to go. You don't have your own mind. You don't have your own vision. You don't have your own direction. You don't know how to say no. You don't know what to stay away from. You don't know who to stay away from. You are just led where other people lead you. And the text says that they come to Jesus. Now, I know many of you, when you heard the title, The Right Touch, you automatically assume that that meant Jesus. And it does. But it's a little deeper than that. And the reason I called it The Right Touch, Wes, is because Jesus is neither the first or the only person to touch him. He's blind. Which means if he's been blind, he's been led by other people. If he's been led, that means other people have had their hands on him. So other people have touched him but could not heal him. Because it matters who puts their hands on you. <laughs> okay. Okay, other people have touched him but had, could not cure him because every touch cannot transform you, every hand cannot heal you, and every contact cannot cure you. Preach, sir. And the problem with many of us is we're letting the wrong people put their hands on us. And because the wrong people are putting their hands on us, we are walking away still blind. It matters who puts their hands on you. Now, if I could go into the context of of the text that means that sometimes the hands we allow on us in the first century it would have been Jewish hands that could not help them it would have been Roman hands that could not help them and in this modern day it is this new spirituality in this modern day it is life coaching in this modern day it's Aliana fixing your life Oprah fixing your life Steve Harvey fixing y'all done got quiet and the problem with many of us is is that we're listening to life coaches. We're reading books who have hands but can't help you. You got too many churches who are having the wrong hands. Too many churches are touching folk but ain't changing nobody. We're touching them with cotton candy sermons. We're touching them with music that's cute but not correct. We're touching them trying to be seeker friendly. We're touching them looking more like a club than a church. And they're leaving out the same way they came. They come and shout but leave jacked up because we touch them but don't transform them. Some of y'all been getting the wrong touch. You've been getting touches that you thought would make you somebody. So you got touched with marriage and you weren't ready for it. You got touched with a job thought that would make you somebody. You got touched with education thinking success would define you. But today I came to declare that there is another touch that you need in order to have vision. And it's the touch of Jesus Christ. Everybody else can touch you and you'll never change but if Jesus puts his hands on you the old folk put it this way he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know he touched me made me oh y'all sit down come on now Woo! he touched me how 
do I get the touch? Watch this. Watch the question. How do I get the touch that will ignite my vision? Did you get that? How do I get the touch? That's going to ignite my vision. I've got three quick things and then we're going to eat. Here's the first thing. The first thing the text is telling to teach us is that if you're going to move to vision, you have to be connected to the proper people. Ooh. Relationship means everything. Who you are connected to has everything to do with everything. When you go to the book of beginnings and read the book of Genesis, you will discover that God puts a whole lot of stock in relationship. Come here, can I prove it to you? Yeah, have you ever found it interesting that God says in the book of beginnings, it is not good for man to be alone. That always tripped me out, preachers, because he had God. So how can he have God and God claim he's alone? Jesus, I don't have time to preach that. This is our power. And so, uh, but if you read the Bible, the Bible says that God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Watch this. And then after that, he says, not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable. Now, let's take that out of the marital interpretation and just put it into the relationship interpretation. Because what trips me out, Howard, is that if you read the text, after God makes the statement, I'm going to make him a helper, God does not create Eve. He creates animals. And the text says that the animals paraded before Adam to see what he would name them. And then almost parenthetically, the Holy Spirit put in there, but there was not a suitable helper found amongst them. Y'all gonna miss it. Then God put Adam to sleep. If I pull over and I keep the motor running, will y'all let me pull over? You never get to your blessing till you stop messing with the beasts. I, I don't have time to preach that. I don't have pre I don't have time to preach that. I don't have time to preach that. And so, and so God then creates Eve. Don't miss the point I'm trying to make is that God knew Adam had God, but God knew that there were some things Adam needed that God would provide, but God wouldn't do. Y'all missed that one. Relationship is everything. You've got to be connected to the right kind of people. And the text gives us a description of who those people are. You need people in your life who will make themselves enemies to your weaknesses. You need people in your life who are so committed to you being all that God wants you to be that they will agitate you until you get out of anything that is beneath your purpose, value, and potential. Preach, boy. Here's what I love about this text. Everybody that brings the man to Jesus can see. Don't miss this. They bring the man to Jesus because they want the man to have what they have sight y'all are missing this they bring the man to Jesus because they want the man to be able to have the same use of the resource they have get away from people who want to keep you beneath them and don't want you to elevate like they have elevated you need people in your life who want to share what they have and share how they got what they got and help you get up get rid of the crab mentality get rid of the haters get rid of all the jealous folk and you find you somebody who can help you know how they got it and want you to have it they make themselves enemies to your weaknesses hold on and here's the other thing I love about these kind of friends I'm almost done what I love about these kind of friends is that watch this I love this then we they will initiate the intervention of intercession without your invitation. Huh. I'm going to come get you. They, they, yeah, yeah. he told me to take my time. I'm going to preach. Uh, he, they will initiate the intervention of intercession without your invitation. It's in the text. Intercession is when I take the issue or the problem of somebody else selflessly to the presence of the Lord. So they bring this man's issue to the feet of Jesus. That's intercession. But nowhere in the text do I see where the man asked to be brought. 
Nowhere in the text does it say they brought him because the man said, will you take me to Jesus? Nowhere in the text does it say they brought him because the man said, I need y'all to find me Jesus. They of their own initiative, the Greek word for brought there is a strong word in the Greek koinonia text. It almost implies they dragged. It almost implies they gave him no choice. I need friends in my life who don't wait till I ask for prayer to pray for me. I need friends in my life who are so in touch with the Spirit that the Spirit can put me on their mind and they start praying for me sometimes without me ever knowing it. Do you know how you got delivered from some stuff? Somebody prayed for you. Do you know how you got out of some stuff? Somebody prayed for you. Do you know how some stuff got blocked that you weren't smart enough to walk away from somebody prayed for you and I think on Alfred Street corner in Alexandria somebody ought to just wave your hand and say God thank you for a praying mama thank you for a praying daddy thank you for a praying grandmama thank you for a praying friend old church put it this way somebody prayed for me had me on their mind took the time and prayed for me I'm so glad they prayed you need friends who will pray for you even when you're not asking for prayer. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. If you're going to get your vision, you got to be connected to the proper people. Secondly, if you're going to get your vision, you got to learn how to be patient with the process. You Listen, this is very tweetable. You cannot microwave maturity. This, this new preacher that wants to be an overnight sensation is absolutely fooling him or herself. I, I, I travel all over the country as your pastor does. And you know what gets on my last nerve? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for keeping my tongue because I, I remember that wasn't... I might have said that a whole different way at Bethel, but let me tell you what gets on my nerves. When young preachers will approach me and they don't ask me what books I'm reading. They ask me who made my soup. As if you even got the money, number one. <laughs> to pay for the suit I have on. Number two. As if when I was your age, I was wearing suits like this but they're so anxious and thirsty to be on top that they don't appreciate the process it takes for God to make you into the man or woman of God that God wants you to be. Anything you get quick, you ain't going to keep. And it's not just preachers. It's this whole millennial, this whole millennial generation. They don't want to work for anything. They want everything quicker than right now, sooner than not yet, which is why they're going to these churches with these preachers who are pimps parading as preachers, talking about, I'll give you a check in seven days, or if I lay hands on you, you're going to have accelerated debt cancellation. Talking about there's going to be a check in the mail in 14 days. They're going to these churches who are teaching them that God is some kind of infinitesimal Santa Claus who hopscotches down from glory to give you what you want on a silver plate. The devil is a liar. God will take you through some stuff to make you and mold you into who he wants you to be. And you've got to appreciate the journey as much as you appreciate the destination. Here we have a process. I got to go. Here, here we have a process. Here we have a process. Watch the process in the text. In the process, in the process of God getting you where he wants you to open your eyes for vision, here it is. There's going to be a season of separation. You ain't going to like this. See, I'm in the text. Watch the text. The text says, the people brought him and Jesus took him. Come back. The people brought him. Jesus took him. The people brought him. Jesus took him. Jesus took him from the people that brought him. When Jesus took him, he didn't invite the people that brought him. But when Jesus took him, he took him from where they brought him and who he brought and who brought him. Jesus disconnected him. 
from the people that brought him. Watch this. Because their only assignment was to get him to Jesus, not to go with him where Jesus is taking him. And the mistake we often make is trying to keep people permanent who were intended to be transitional. You can oftentimes make the mistake of trying to keep people around longer than their assignment was supposed to be in your life. And that's when you get in trouble because the only people who should be in your life are people who have an assignment for your life. If you don't have an assignment for my life, there's no reason for you to be in my life. He, who, this is going to be bad grammar, but it's good gospel. Who do you need to be took from? It's bad, bad grammar, but it's good gospel. Who do you need to be took from? Now I need to balance it and have integrity to the text because normally when we hear this kind of thing, you need to be disconnected from people. It's normally followed especially in this neo-Pentecostal day of preaching, it's normally followed by get away from them because they're demonic. Get away from them because they got spirits. Get away from them because you don't want them spirits around you. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If I'm mature in the faith, you ain't got no spirit that can jump on me. I mean, that's just, that's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. But you know, that's only what we hear. Get away from them. You don't want their spirit on you. Get away from them. They're demonic. Now, that might be true, but that's not the truth of this text. The truth of this text is a harder check test, uh, uh, harder test, Wes, because in this text, Jesus disconnects him from people who have been healthy for him. Oh. Oh. This isn't disconnect from jacked up or dysfunctional people. This is a disconnect from people who want him to be delivered. See, you have to be mature enough to know how you need sometimes to have seasons of solitude where you even separate from people who mean you good. Y'all done got quiet now. You have to want what the Lord has for you because sometimes he cannot speak to you because you got too many other voices in your ear. Sometimes he cannot give you vision because you got too many opinions you're listening to. And you have to be smart enough sometimes to disconnect from people who are healthy for you but cannot go with you. Watch this. Because if they go with you, their love for you might become your stumbling block. What you mean? Because Jesus is going to spit on him. And if I love him like I love him, I might try to stop the process because I don't think he needs to go through that. you got some people who love you so much that they'll see what you're going through, not knowing you've got to go through it and do everything they can to talk you out of it, and you'll miss your blessing because their love became your obstacle. you got some folk that love you too much. Who do you need to get a quiet time from? I don't have time to pray. I told Jesus, separates him. And then Jesus says to him, do you see anything? It's going to get good. I apologize, Wes. If they tear up the pews, I'll, I'll send a check. I'm lying. But... Us. I'm done in 10 minutes, but these next two minutes are going to get crazy. Jesus says, do you see anything? Homeboy says, I love the rustic language of the King James. He said, I see men, but it looked like trees walking. Jesus said, wait a minute. Well, Jesus didn't say that. That's my interpretation. Jesus said, wait a minute. I didn't ask you what you see. I asked you, do you see? You're answering what you see. Woo! And you're answering it in such a negative because you are so consumed by what's not still right that you don't know how to affirm what's better than it used to be. You round here talking about I see, but it ain't right. 
but you ought to be saying at least I can see something because before today I couldn't see anything and that's my question to you I know everything's not right in your life but do you see anything I know you can't pay all your bills but do you see anything I know your marriage is still struggling but do you see anything I know your child is still crazy but do you see anything I know your friends are still fickle but do you see anything I know you can't find a job but do you see anything you ain't sleeping under a bridge you're not sleeping in a cardboard box you got a good night's sleep you know your name you got to church do you see it and somebody ought to shout today because your life might not be perfect but at least you have progress Come on, shake somebody's hand. Tell them it's better than it used to be. It's better than it used to be. I know it's not perfect, but I thank God it's better than it. I'm done. So, Jesus said, Jesus said, wait a minute, I got to touch you again. I got to touch you again because... If I leave you looking like this, seeing men but looking like trees, you might treat men like trees and trees like people. I can't leave you like this because you might run the risk of treating objects better than you treat people. God, that's a whole nother sermon. So Jesus touches him again. And the Bible says he saw everything clearly. I'm done. There's going to be concrete, concrete evidence of your clarity. Here's how you know you got vision. You ready? Jesus gives him one, in the New International Version, gives him one command. But if you go back to the original Greek Koinonia text, there are really two commands. It's in the King James. There are two commands Jesus really gives him. The first command is in the New International Version where Jesus says, go home. Don't go back to the village. Now, they bring him out of the village. So, exegetically, we already know that the village they brought him out of is not home. Because Jesus says, go home. Don't go back to the village. The village they bring him out of is Bethsaida. Bethsaida in biblical days was a cursed place. So Jesus says, now that you can see, don't go back to places beneath your value. Now that you can see, don't go back to places that will bring you back down to who you used to be. He said, I forgave you when they brought you out of there because you just had to go where people led you. But now that you can see when they try to lead you, you can tell them I ain't going back there. See, when you got your vision, you'll say there's some things I'm never going back to. I'm not going back to being that needy. I'm not going back to being that thirsty. I'm not going back to being that insecure. I'm not going back to being that depressed. I'm not going back to being that discouraged there's some things well wait a minute the command that's not in the new international version that's in the original in the king james is when he said and don't tell nobody wait wait a minute Jesus. wait a minute wait a minute i've been blind i can see and you telling me don't tell nobody I ain't going where you think I'm going you think I'm going when the Lord has done something for you that you've been living with and delivers you how do you keep it to yourself that's a good shout that ain't where I'm going Dr. Miles Jones used to always accuse me of being too analytical and here I go again here was my question Wes how do I even hide the fact that I can now see because I don't have to tell nobody. All they got to do is watch how I walk. Because stuff I used to trip over, I step over. Stuff I used to stumble over, I walk around. Because the evidence of transformation ain't your tongues. It ain't your shout. It's the way you walk. When your lifestyle is better, that's the evidence of your change. When your lifestyle is better, that's the evidence of your transformation. The old folks said, when you see me walking right, that's evidence that the Lord is using me. I'm done. I'm sorry I kept y'all too long. I'm done. This 
is not a miracle of first things. This is evidence of a get back. Huh? This ain't evidence of Jesus giving him something he's never had. This is evidence of Jesus giving him something that he lost. Can I prove it to you? Do you see anything? I see me. But they look like tree. If he was born blind, he wouldn't know what a man looks like. If he was born blind, he wouldn't know what a tree looks like. The only reason he knows it is because he's seen it. This ain't Jesus giving him something he's never had. It's Jesus giving him something back he lost. And I'm done. Is there anybody in here today who can say, I want it all back? I want my joy. Come on, let's hit D flat. I want my joy back. I want my mind back. I want my peace back. I want my family back. I want my children back. I want my vision back. I want my smile back. I want my business back. I want my finances back. Is there anybody in here who can say I want it all back? Everything I messed up. Everything I got taken away from me. Everything that got snatched from me. The Lord can give it all back. Now there's some things I don't want back. But if the Lord God gave it to me. I'm telling him, give it all back. I'm ready to treat it better. I'm ready to manage it better. I'm ready to do better. And is there anybody in this room today who can say, I haven't smiled in a long time, but I want my smile back. I haven't been positive in a long time, but I want positivity back. I want my joy back. Good afternoon. Noon Alfred Street. May the Lord God bless you real good. But is there anybody in here who can help me close this sermon? Stand on your feet if you want it all back. Wave your hand if you want it all back. Clap for joy if you want it all back. I promise you this is the last time. But would you take one neighbor by the hand and tell your neighbor, neighbor, oh, neighbor, get it all back. That was the wrong neighbor. Turn on the other side. Put your arms around your neighbor. Shake them and rock them. Rock them and shake them. Shake them and rock them. And tell them, neighbor, It all. I feel like preaching. I need a few witnesses today who know the Lord will give it back to you. The Lord will restore it to you. The Lord will fix it for you because he gave me back my life. I lost my life in the Garden of Eden, but he died on Calvary to give me back my life. And if you ain't got nothing else, you ought to shout because you got your life back. You ought to shout because you got salvation back. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he fight your battles? Won't he make your enemies your footstool? Won't he give you joy and sorrow? Won't he give you hope for tomorrow? Won't he dry your tears? Won't he, 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 because I know I'm going to get it all back. Because I know he's going to bless me again. I'm going to give him the praise for everything I get back. And is there anybody in Alfred Street today who can thank your Lord that he restored your life? Can you thank your Lord that he restored your joy? And Wave your hand and tell God thank you that I got my sight back. Tell God thank you that I got my vision. And I once 
was blind, but now I see. I find your neighbor and tell them neighbor. Shout because you got it back. Give God praise because you got it back. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Do you have your joy? Then say so. Do you have your mind? Then say so. Do you have your peace? Then say so. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 